And there we go. You know what it is? I mute my microphone and then I unmute it before I start shooting, but I waited till the last second this time. Now you've caught up. Welcome to Founder of the Day. My face is red. We're going to be discussing the last seven founders published on founderoftheday.com. Also, here on YouTube, I publish an article and a video every day about the same person. So, uh, we are going to start off with... Well, let's bounce right over here. I got a little bit of a new setup here. Here we go. Hi. Uh, we are not starting off with Samuel Osgood. Well, I put all the images up and I forgot to take them down and everyone left. Okay, we are going to start with the Federal Farmer. As always, we start with the Federal Farmer when we do these weekly wrap-ups. So, Federal Farmer number 11. Uh, for those of you who are new here, it's a series of anti-federalist papers written in New York. Probably by Melanchthon Smith, though we'll never be 100% sure of that. Mostly in response to the fe um, Federalist arguments, though the Federalist papers start coming out about halfway through the Federal Farmer series. So, Federal Farmer number 11. He finally moves away from the House of Representatives to talk about the United States Senate. Though, spoiler alert, next week he does go back to <laughs> the House of Representatives. But, let's continue. So, Federal Farmer moves on from the United States House of Representatives to the Senate, and what's interesting is he finds a bunch of things regarding the Senate surprisingly agreeable, despite all his criticisms. Now, he does have criticisms, if I can say it right, uh, that we will get to, but I want to talk about what he agrees with. First of all, he actually agrees with the idea of the senators being represented, uh, being appointed by the states themselves. Uh, he thinks that it's more democratic this way, actually. One of his common complaints is that there's not enough people in the House of Representatives to truly represent the people themselves. Now, from our perspective, having the state government just choose state senators, or, or just choose federal senators, that seems a little bit off collar, but the farmer's perspective was they're electing the people to the state governments and their votes are counted more when voting for state governments than they are for federal government because there's less people voting for each individual position. Therefore, they're actually more representative in the hand selecting of senators by the state government than voting for members of the House of Representatives. He also likes that, uh, oh, I should note there has been an amendment to the Constitution. Now we do vote for our state senators. Either way, uh, Farmer also really likes that there are there's equal representation in the Senate. He thinks this is a truly federal system. Now, I know there are questions about it at the time, uh, and it certainly seemed kind of elitist to certain people to have, you know, an equal number in the House. Why? You should have the people should be represented equally. But in a federal system, as the farmer sees it, well, you should just have this little bit. You should, you know, e each state should be represented equally because the state should hold much of their sovereignty, if not all of it. Now let's move on to some of the things he disagreed with. First of all, the farmer disagrees with the term length for United States senators wholeheartedly. <laughs> uh, six years is a very long time, and he is afraid that people will get just a little bit too comfortable in this scenario. In fact, I have a quote here from this particular essay that I'd like to read. Quote, men elected for several years, several hundred miles distant from their states, possessed of very extensive powers, and the means of paying themselves will not, probably, be oppressed with a sense of dependence and responsibility. Now, by dependence and responsibility, he means on and to the people. He actually makes a recommendation. He's not exactly sure how long it should be, but he, he does like that senators are there for longer than members of the House of Representatives. Of course, as he likes to say, this is supposed to be the aristocratical class in the Senate as opposed to the democratical in the House of Representatives. And he does think they should be there a little longer, specifically for stability. However... He thinks six years is too long, as I said. He says three or four years should suffice. So, he then moves on to the next problem he has with the United States Senate. The ability to recall senators. Why 
can the states, if the states are just appointing the senators, if the state government government just appoints senators, why can't the state government just recall senators? You can do that with ambassadors, and they're essentially ambassadors to the federal government. Also, and this isn't specifically argued in Federal Farmer Number Eight, but it is a common anti-federalist argument. Uh, if you hire someone to do a job for you, why can't you fire them whenever they're doing a bad job? Why do you have to wait until the contract's up? Just fire them. Next, the federal farmer moves on to the idea of rotation. He's afraid that people might be stuck in office for way too long. Now, he doesn't really, he doesn't come out and say, hey, we can only limit the amount of terms. His idea actually reflects what the Continental Congress had already done. Continental Congress said for every six-year period, one could only be a congressman for three of those six years. Uh, the farmer does recommend extending that to four years. So in every six-year period, you can only be a senator for four years. Again, he wants to abbreviate the total amount of time to three or four years. But that means if you are a senator for three years, then you can't be elected a senator twice in a row. And in a four-year period. So the next term after that, you also can't run, if that makes any sense. Because uh, if, if you're for three years, you have to wait four more years to be elected again. So you'd have to wait for two more terms, though you could be appointed uh, in, in an interim in case of an absence, things like that. Uh, and lastly, the federal farmer talks about officers. Now, the last section is mostly about treaties. And again, the federal farmer actually agrees with a lot of what the Senate has to do with treaties. Uh, specifically, the farmer says, why uh, I'd, I can't come up with a better policy than this. I have my doubts about it, but I'm not going to come up with a better policy. Uh, he then goes on uh, to briefly in there, he mentions that uh, why is why does the Senate have anything to do with appointing officers? Officers of the government are supposed to carry out the laws made by Congress, a.k.a. execute them, which is something you generally leave to the executive branch. Now, that's about where he leaves it off. <laughs> um, he also notes that if Congress is the one who's supposed to pay the officers, they certainly shouldn't have anything to do with appointing them because that can affect the pay scale and such. All right, that's the federal farmer. Let's move on. I know I'm going to take a quick sip of water here. I notice a lot of people bounce out of that right away. Maybe I shouldn't be starting with the anti-federalist papers, but I'm doing it because I have fun with it. All right, looky see who's next. Josiah Hornblower. This guy is fun and very obscure. Now, Josiah Hornblower was born in England and his father and older brother were early employ early not inventors but artisans who worked on steam engines steam engines were first invented in britain uh, about 50 years maybe 60 years about before the american revolution mostly for mining purposes if you were digging a mine you dug down a certain depth and then they would usually start to flood and that's no good so the steam engine was invented to pump water out of mines so they could dig even farther and make even more money now, Great Britain was very secretive about how these particular uh, devices worked. Great Britain did not want anyone else learning how to do this, especially France. But they, they tried to keep it secret. Some people snuck out of England with the knowledge. And Josiah Hornblower is one of these people. After learning the trade from his father and brother, he got a few pieces he knew he'd need. And he moved to North America, where he was employed by the Schuyler family who is super famous now thanks to the Broadway musical Hamilton. Uh, Philip Schuyler, the patriarch at the time, brings him over, uh, puts him in northern New Jersey, and essentially says, hey, I've got some mines here that need some drainage. Could you build me a steam engine? And Josiah Hornblower builds the first working steam engine in North America. And to my understanding, the first working steam engine outside of Great uh, England proper. So Hornblower comes over, he's in northern New Jersey, he's dumping the water out to the Passiac River, I believe it's pronounced, and he does this for about 20 years. He also opens a shop uh, and helps advise other people on their engineering needs. 
becomes one of the go-to engineers in the late colonial period. Then the American Revolution breaks out, breaks out, and Hornblower has now been in the United States for 20 years, and he considers himself an American now. He's actually elected to the New Jersey Assembly on several occasions during the Revolutionary period, and then later on is sent to the Continental Congress. He hangs out in the Continental Congress really about the time the Constitution is getting ratified. Now, by this point, we have, as we've discussed before, uh, several people have invented different uses for the steam engine, notably on boats. And in fact, once the Constitution is ratified, one of the first issues that comes across the table is patents. And specifically with patents, there are four people trying to patent steam engines. And the Congress at this point makes a very important decision, which is when you make a patent, you don't just make a patent for a steam engine or a steamboat. You make a patent for all the specific parts of your steamboat and how they work. And a lot of that. So it's the steamboat that leads to this. That's why, like, you can have an iPhone now or a Samsung, even though they're both basically touchscreen phones, they are different in how they operate. Uh, their operating systems and that's what makes them different and we can trace that back to what I call the steam wars at the beginning of the American or uh, just in the two three years after the Constitution was ratified and most of these people knew how to build steam engines because of information brought to the United States by Josiah Hornblower. Hornblower would uh, after this semi-retire by this point uh, he would become a county judge in New Jersey for the better part of 20 years. Uh, and that's really where his story ends, but his legacy lives on. Uh, like I said, when you look at your iPhone compared to your friends, Samsung or my Google phone, what is it, Google Pixel, <laughs> um, uh, which I like. Anyway, uh, that's Josiah Hornblower. If you guys have any questions, please let me know. I'm happy to answer, And we'll, but we'll move on to our next founder, Rufus King. Oakley Doakley. So Rufus King, if you don't know this name, you're about to. Because if you're studying the American Revolution, Rufus King is one of those names that's extraordinarily important. Uh, he's a signer of the Constitution, uh, which we will get to. Uh, but his, his role in the Federalist Party in the later years of that party are extremely important. That's why I reference him as the final Federalist. To be fair, his story ends before John Marshall. Uh, but we'll get we'll get there. John Marshall was appointed long before Rufus King was done. So Rufus King uh, grows up in Massachusetts. Actually, he grows up for a while in Maine, and his father is a merchant. And because of people's anger at merchants leading up to the American Revolution, uh, his house in Maine is actually ransacked by patriots or future patriots. Uh, this terrifies the family. And you can even read John Adams talking about it once after a conversation with King regarding it. The family was terrified. It leads Rufus King's father to become a loyalist. But Rufus and his two brothers all become patriots, really important patriots. One of his brothers becomes the first governor of Maine, and the other one has an active role in Massachusetts politics. So they become real important patriots. But King, he's 22 years old. He goes down, he studies at Harvard for a while, and then he leaves his study of the law at 22 to join the Revolutionary War. Now, he's only in the war for a little bit, but because of his situation, he's appointed as a major and accepts the role as aide-de-camp to General John Sullivan and participates in part of the Rhode Island campaign. It's pretty high level for a, a young man, but he leaves fairly quickly because King was elected to the Massachusetts uh, uh, General Court or the, the State Assembly, as it was called at the time. And he spends the next several years working his way up through Massachusetts politics until eventually he's sent to the Continental Congress. And he's in the Continental Congress in the 1780s when uh, many young men are using it as a stepping stone to increase their responsibilities in state governments. It was a uh, it was not a sexy position for people who were established in their states because under the Articles of Confederation, the states retained their sovereignty and acted for all intents and purposes as independent nations. So going to the uh, League of Friendship, as the Articles of Confederation literally styles itself, uh, was seen as a young man's game to make your way up. But King was one of these young men like Alexander Hamilton and James Madison and a half dozen others who went to the Continental Congress at this time and said, 
oh, we're in trouble. We owe a lot of money, but we have no way of paying it back. What are we doing here? Um, because of this, uh, Rufus King is one of the Massachusetts men sent to the Constitutional Convention. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, King goes to the Constitutional Convention. He is a very active member of the convention, speaks a whole bunch. He's a member of the Committee of Post uh, Committee of Postponed Parts that we've discussed with David Brearley recently, uh, where he helped resolve issues that have been tabled throughout the summer of 1787. And then he's a part of the Committee of Style that actually writes the final draft of the Constitution. Now, Governor Morris gets all the credit for that, but he was on the committee looking over Morris's shoulder. King, as I said, signs that thing. He likes that Constitution. He signs it. He goes back to Massachusetts and really promotes first ratification, which it is very narrowly, as in many of the biggest, most important states at the time, it was a narrow vote. Now, just because Massachusetts passed it, not everyone was very happy. So King says, hey, guys, make me a senator. And at a time where senators were appointed by the states, the state of Massachusetts said, no, dude, <laughs> no, go away. Uh, and he does. He goes away. On the advice of his friend Alexander Hamilton, he moves to New York, where after just a few months, he is appointed as a United States Senator for the inaugural run of the United States Congress under the Constitution. Yes, he literally left the state that wouldn't let him be a Senator, went to a different state that said you can be a Senator. <laughs> and New York, killing it. Uh, I find this extra fascinating because at the time, New York was a swing state. You know, for years, it would it would bounce between Federalist and Anti-Federalist governors, or, or I shouldn't say uh, Democratic-Republican governors. George Clinton, the governor at the time, was an Anti-Federalist, would later be a Democratic-Republican vice president, yada, yada, and yada. Now, King would be a senator for a brief little bit, uh, but he only, he serves for seven years, so he serves a full term, but then he resigns when George Washington, President Washington, approaches him and said, would you like to take over as minister to Great Britain? And King says, yeah. Uh, much the way Continental Congress was a stepping stone uh, before the Constitution, being a minister abroad was certainly a stepping stone after the Constitution. I mean, you look, Jefferson and Adams have both served overseas. Monroe would go over there, would be there when King shows up. I believe he was still around. So it was a good way to make your future. So King goes to Great Britain. He's there during uh, the end of the uh, uh, Washington administration, the whole Adams administration. So he's John Adams's mouthpiece to the King of Great Britain during the quasi-war with France, which is no small feat keeping England out of a war with France. Uh, when J Thomas Jefferson comes on board, he actually retains Rufus King, which, again, one of the big things about Adams... Jefferson taking over for Adams as president is this was a peaceful transition of power from one party to another, which in the history of revolutions around the world is not usually how that goes down. Uh, Jefferson went through and replaced most of Adams's men with his own, but he keeps King there. And this says a lot. This says a number of things to me. First of all, it demonstrates the respect many people had for Rufus King at the time uh, as just an able ambassador. It also says that Jefferson realized the Federalists wanted to be friendly with Great Britain. And Rufus King was a Federalist who was friendly with Great Britain. Maybe if we don't want to go to war with Great Britain, we keep Rufus King around. And they did. And things were pretty smooth for a while there. Eventually in 1803, just after the Louisiana Purchase over in France, Rufus King decides to come back to the United States. He was just done being over there, is, is the impression I received from him, uh, from what I read about him. However, uh, it's shortly after that that... Great Britain really ups their impressing soldiers game and did a few other things that would end up leading to the War of 1812. Though we should note the Napoleonic Wars in Europe uh, led to both France and England saying to America, if you trade with our enemy, we're going to destroy you. So Jefferson did the Embargo Act and, and that had a lot to do with the coming War of 1812. But not to get too off topic, Rufus King runs against Thomas Jefferson. Kind of. See, at this point, after the whole Jefferson Aaron Burr debacle, now they started having tickets where you ran for president and someone else ran as your vice presidential candidate. And the first time they did this system, 
Charles Coatsworth Pinckney runs for president against Thomas Jefferson and his vice presidential candidate, the first ever official vice presidential candidate for the Federalist Party, was Rufus King. I told you going to Great Britain was a stepping stone. He comes back the next year, he runs for vice president, and he and Pinckney are demolished. In fact, that 1804 victory by Thomas Jefferson remains today the widest margin of victory in presidential history. Sorry, Rufy, that's just what happens. Four years later, though, James Madison is running for president. And what do the Federalist Party do? Well, they pick the same two guys. Charles Coatsworth Pinckney again runs for president, and vice presidential candidate is Rufus King. They again lose pretty handily. Now, by 1812, the War of 1812 is breaking out, and the Federalist Party is hurting. In New York, where, again, it's kind of a swing state, uh, DeWitt Clinton, who was formerly mayor of New York and spent time in the Senate, he ends up running against James Madison for president. The Federalist Party does not even field a candidate. It is two members of the same party running for president. However, the Federalist Party supports DeWitt Clinton because they see him as both fairly likely to win the election and more aligned with their feelings, uh, more apt to take care of some of the issues they prefer, like not going to war with Great Britain, which certainly seemed like it was starting to happen and would start by the time the election actually takes place. Rufus King does not like this. He's been a Federalist for, at this point, by 1812, from 1787 till 1812. What is that? 10, 25 years? Don't let my party die. We need to run a candidate. And he really pushes for it. Now, it doesn't happen, but people take notice. And Federalists do vote for him, even though he's not their candidate. Uh, he, he actually wins 2% of the popular vote, which is not a lot. But as really the first third-party candidate in the history of the United States, it's fairly impressive. Not nearly as impressive as many other third-party candidates received, but it's fairly impressive. So impressive, in fact, that in 1816, the Federalists had a change of heart. You see, things had gone bad through the War of 1812, uh, especially with the Hartford Convention, which you may or may not know about, took place in Hartford, Connecticut. A bunch of New England Federalists had a meeting, a convention, uh, to discuss the fact that they'd been at war for four years, with great, uh, for two and a half years with Great Britain, who they did not want to go to war with and actually would prefer to be more friendly with than Napoleonic France. They have this meeting called the Hartford Convention. Now, Rufus King does not attend. Many important Federalists don't attend. Some important Federalists do attend to make sure that no one tries to cede from the Union because the Democrats have been claiming that this meeting was a group of Federalists who wanted to leave the Union and destroy America and side with Britain in the war and fight against the rest of New York South, basically. Now, this had been floated by one or two people in private letters, but was not the intention of the meeting. Actually, what they wanted to do was write a series of amendments to the United States Constitution. Like, maybe you can't have someone from Virginia be president every single time, except those four years John Adams was around. Which, at this point, James Madison is approaching his... Eight years of Washington, four years of Adams, eight years of Jefferson, eight years of Madison, and the next guy up is James Monroe, also a Virginian. <laughs> um, so they didn't care for that. Unfortunately for them, by the time they send their letter of recommended amendments, there were there were several other amendments also they, they wanted. Um, by the time the letter arrives in Washington, D.C., that's about the time word arrives that Andrew Jackson had just won a major victory in New Orleans. It also is about the time word arrives from England, uh, I'm sorry, uh, yes, from England, that uh, guess what? The war ended a few months ago. Uh, this made the Federalists look horrible. Um, I should side note, the war didn't arrive from England, it arrived from the Netherlands. It was the Treaty of Ghent ended the war, came from Netherlands, they met in neutral territory. Not that that matters much. And I bring all this up because that's the scenario in 1816 where the Federalist Party, who again didn't run a candidate the pre previous election, decides to do one last hurrah. We are going to try and run one more candidate or our party will collapse. And they did. And they chose the only guy they could have chosen. Rufus King. 
1816, Rufus King is the last person to run for president of the United States. Now, fortunately for King, James Mattis, James Monroe had made quite a name for himself being both Secretary of State and Secretary of War during the War of 1812 when they won that war. As I've said before, at the time, being vice president wasn't really your ticket to be president. You weren't next in line. If you were Secretary of State, you were next in line to be president, and Matt Monroe was. Um, now, he wins pretty handedly, and uh, King is essentially done. Uh, as we discussed recently, James Monroe would go to the next election and run unopposed because there was no Federalist Party and no one from within who wanted the position. That would change the following election in 1824 when four Democratic Republicans uh, end up with a corrupt bargain. But we're not going into that. We are sticking with Rufus King, who goes home. Uh, I, I'll, I should note, he does carry the states of Massachusetts, Delaware, and Connecticut. So he does win three states, including his former home state of Massachusetts. He goes back, uh, and this is more than 30 years after signing the Constitution. He's actually supported by New York and is sent back to the United States Senate in his old age. Uh, surprisingly, despite, again, having not, how do you say, uh, having been the head of the Federalist Party as it died, the Democrat, uh, the Democratic Republican New York, they... I guess they see him as a unifying character, and New York sends him back to the United States Senate. Uh, after six more years, a full term in the Senate, King is then chosen to replace, uh, um, he's chosen by President John Quincy Adams, at this point, to go back and become minister to Great Britain once again. Now, he's only there for about a year and a half, nothing much comes of it, he ends up retreating back to the United States, and he dies shortly thereafter. And by this point, we've gone through a very long life, and he's grown very old. And uh, before we end on him, I want to talk about, uh, I didn't speak much about it in my article, or I don't think in the video <clears throat> earlier this week, Rufus King is one of the real abolitionists of the American founding. From day one, I don't know of him ever owning a slave. He might have at one or two points in his life, but I don't know of that. He speaks real eloquently on a number of occasions while he's fighting to keep the Federalists alive about slavery and it's what's wrong with it. And uh, he talks about it not only in economic grounds, like you hear many founders talking about it, but on humanitarian grounds. Uh, he literally says, if we hold people in bondage, then we are forsaking the liberties we claim to fight for. He's one of the few founders to outright say that for his whole life through his death. There's a lot of good quotes that he has. Um, actually, I live not far from Auburn, New York, where there's a cool uh, human rights uh, little center there uh, because Harry Tubman lived there. She's buried there. There's a bunch of uh, human rights advocates that had gone through Auburn. And of all the pictures on the wall with cool quotes about equality and liberty below them, uh, Rufus King is the only founder that actually makes his name up on that wall, which I always find fascinating. Uh, he really was one of the early people fighting, and I know by this point, by later in his life, you know, Massachusetts had accidentally outlawed slavery, Pennsylvania, New York, uh, most of the North had outlawed slavery by this point, but he was the one talking to the South and saying, this is garbage. In fact, he was in the Senate during 1820 when they have the Missouri Compromise. Okay, we'll let Maine become a state because it'll be free and we'll bring in Missouri, but that can be a slave state. And Rufus King was like, no, like literally stood on the floor of Congress. I was like, no, this is wrong, bad, <laughs> naughty. Like, uh, so you, I, I always like to, I always like to point that out for Rufus King, uh, how he went above and beyond what we expect from even the most anti-slavery advocates of the American founding. He's really in the North, th the guy. Um, that being said, I'm going to take a sip of my water, and unless you have any questions on Rufus King, we'll move along. Rufy K over here is a lot of fun. If you like the Federalists. <laughs> All right, let's pop up Wait Sail Avery. Wait Sail, one of the many amazing names you get when you read about the American Revolution. Now, Wait Sail, as it says next to me, dueled with Andrew Jackson. Quick note on Jackson. He is not, in my book, an American founder. 
he there American history has an age of Jackson. Uh, and if you have an age named after you, uh, you're from that age, <laughs> um, not the one before it. That being said, uh, Andrew Jackson did kind of participate in the American Revolution. He was wounded. He was scarred on the face by a British soldier when he was 13 because uh, he was being a rude child. Uh, as a very young man, he got a law degree by the time he was 20. He joins William Blount out in Tennessee. He is the first attorney general in Tennessee. When Tennessee becomes a state, he is the one and only first member of the House of Representatives representing Tennessee during the George Washington administration. So there is a lot of overlap when it comes to Andrew Jackson. As we said, we just mentioned him before talking about the War of 1812. So Andrew Jackson was there for the American Revolution, even if you don't really consider him a founder. Now, the first person he dueled was a lot older than he was. Wade Sail Avery was an American founder. In fact, Wade Sail Avery was a young lawyer in North Carolina uh, in the colony of North Carolina before it became a state, before the revolution broke out. And he was actually chosen as uh, attorney general, the royal attorney general. And when the revolution breaks out, believe it or not, he sides with the patriots. He gives up this nice, cushy attorney general job for the crown and sides with the patriots. Turns out to be a good idea because the revolution goes on, independence is declared, and North Carolina becomes a state, and they write a constitution, and in the constitution, they need to have an attorney general, so they choose the guy who's doing it. And Wade Sill Avery becomes North Carolina's first ever attorney general for independent North Carolina. Uh, he does this for a while. He also serves in the local militia during the Revolutionary War. Eventually, he achieves the rank of captain, uh, and he serves on the state assembly on several occasions. I don't know of him actively fighting in any engagements, but he was in the North Carolina militia for a brief bit of time. Again, he seems to have left uh, very quickly to go back to being Attorney General of North Carolina and being in the colonial, uh, uh, I'm sorry, North Carolina State Assembly. Now, why does he duel with Andrew Jackson? Okay. He ends up, uh, after the revolution, going back to private practice, but he traveled a lot. Many lawyers did, especially to the frontier. He would travel to the frontier to help resolve cases out there as Tennessee is making its way up towards statehood. While he's there, uh, he has a tendency to reference Bacon. Now, Bacon was a law book, and he referenced it all the time. It's hard to tell which book, if, if he's referencing a book by Francis Bacon or Matthew Bacon. They both had law books at the time, and we're not really sure which one it was, but he always had the law book in his satchel. And he did this so much that a young attorney who was there decided to play a joke. Now, this young attorney was uh, about a 19, I think, 21-year-old Andrew Jackson. Wade Slavery is 47. I bring this up because the young man decides to replace the Bacon in his satchel that he's always referencing, which is a book, with bacon in his satchel. That was actually bacon. Uh, Andrew Jackson put a slab of bacon in this guy's backpack, and this guy went during court to reference the book and reached into his satchel and pulled out a sloppy piece of bacon, and he was not pleased. Now, it seems like the court giggled, and the uh, other lawyer who played this joke, 21-year-old Andrew Jackson, well, he thought it was the best. <laughs> he was dying. Uh, and A.M. Wade Sell Avery turned on him and lectured him about being a grown-up. We're in a court of law, young man, and this is not how we behave. Who do you think you are? Maybe you're not ready to pursue the law. And other such things like that. I'm paraphrasing. I'm not quoting. I'm paraphrasing because... Well, we only have details from afterwards on this. We don't know exactly how it went down, but the putting the bacon in the bag thing, everyone seems to agree on. Now, Andrew Jackson, who at 21 was technically a man, especially back then when you graduated college at like 16, 17, he did not like, <laughs> excuse me, he did not like being dressed down in front of a courtroom full of people. So that night, Andy Jackson sends Wade Selavery two letters both of which request a duel. Let's go, man. It's time for shooting to get done. So they go and meet on the field the very next day. Now, for whatever reason, for all we know about Andrew Jackson, we don't know what went wrong. We don't know if anyone shot anyone. We don't know if any guns were actually shot. 
What we do know, what seems to have happened, is they both threw their shots away, met in the middle, and shook hands, and let it be, and just let everything slide. Uh, it seems that Wade Sully, Avery, as an older man, was like, I'm not going to shoot this kid in the mouth. And Andrew Jackson, as a younger man, was like, maybe I shouldn't kill people quite yet. And Andrew Jackson would get in some duels. He would, he would get some bullets in him and put bullets in other people as well. But not this time. Everyone goes home, and it actually turns out that they seem to be pretty good friends afterwards. And that's the story of Wade Sell Avery. The man Andrew Jackson dueled the first time. Kind of. <laughs> That's a fun story. Let's move right along. And Samuel John Atley. Okay. I will be honest, we will probably get through Samuel John Atley pretty quickly. He is a real rando. I'm going to take a sip. Clear my throat a bit. And rock on. And guys, let me know uh, if uh, everything's coming through better. I've been playing with the information or the the output of the videos a lot this week so hopefully it looks better and is better quality we haven't run into any like drops yet or anything like that i've increased bit rate and blah 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 i've looked up a bunch of other youtube videos that told me how to do it hopefully it's working let me know samuel john atley no known image that's his great he had fought with the british army in or he fought in the militia to help the British Army during the French and Indian War. During this time, he joined the Forbes Expedition, which is a really important expedition we've discussed a few times here. Uh, most importantly, is George Washington was the highest-ranking American on that uh, journey, and John Samuel John Atlee probably became familiar with George Washington. After that, he returns to Pennsylvania, where he was from, uh, and he had a law practice. Atlee's there, practicing law, and the American Revolution breaks out. He volunteers for the Continental Army uh, in a, in, uh, he becomes a colonel in charge of the Pennsylvania Musketry Battalion. Now, we've discussed, muskets end up being pretty important to the war. Not as important as rifles, but pretty important. He goes uh, to New York, and while he's in New York, he participates in the Battle of Long Island, a.k.a. the Battle of Brit Brooklyn. While there, uh, the British deceive Washington in certain fashion, and... A retreat is ordered. He's fighting at the old stone house, and a retreat is ordered. And Adley actually waits and covers his men's retreat to the point where he is surrounded and has no choice but to surrender. Now, Adley is actually kept in pretty deplorable conditions for a colonel for uh, two years. Somehow he survives. Somehow he doesn't seem to have any lasting conditions. And he returns to Pennsylvania. Very quickly after returning as a hero... He is chosen uh, to, he's elected to the state assembly and then quickly sent to the Continental Congress. Uh, he's in the Continental Congress when the Articles of Confederation are ratified and become the government. Uh, now, he didn't sign them as opposed to the Declaration or the Constitution where everyone there, when they were done, all signed the document at the same time. The Articles of Confederation were signed as the states ratified them. So one state ratifies it, they send their delegates in, they sign it. And it's just the one state has signatures. Another state signs it. So Pennsylvania being in Philadelphia or vice versa, Philadelphia being in Pennsylvania, uh, Pennsylvania ratifies fairly quickly and it's signed before Atlee gets there. But he is there when it becomes the government. Because of his work, he returns to the state government and he is actually elected to the Supreme Executive Council of Pennsylvania representing Lancaster County. During the Revolution, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania's first constitution is a lot of fun. It's a unicameral legislature. It's just one house. There's also no governor. There is a board, an executive board, called the Supreme Executive Council. Now, they did elect a president from among themselves, uh, so there are people who were considered president of Pennsylvania during this time. But really, these men shared the executive power. Uh, Samuel John Atlee is one of these people who was on the executive board of Pennsylvania for several years. Uh, after this time comes to an end, uh, Samuel John Atlee kind of disappears from the, uh, not entirely from the historical record, but from government and politics. He returns to his law practice and seems to keep to himself for the remaining few years of his life. So, Samuel John Atlee, POD, POW to executive council. 
Moving right along here. Let's see who's next. Nathan Brownson. Not Brownstone, as my mouth wants to say every time. Uh, Nathan Brownson. Nathan Brownson's a lot of fun. He is, uh, we spoke about Lyman Hall last week, and he has a lot of similarities with Lyman Hall in that he was a physician from Connecticut who moved to Georgia. Uh, once the revolution breaks out, as a physician might be a leader in a community of the time, he is chosen to go to the Provincial Congress during the revolutionary times. And once independence is declared in 1777, Brownson is sent to the Continental Congress. He does a few fun things at the Continental Congress. He works really closely with the aforementioned Lyman Hall uh, to help make sure George is getting what it needs down there and not getting overlooked. Then he goes to Vermont. You see, Vermont was saying, let us be a state. Can we be a state? What's up? Let us be a state. Brownson is sent to Vermont representing the Continental Congress to determine if they meet the qualifications to actually be a state. And guess what? Brownson realizes they do. He goes back to the Congress and he says, yeah, they pretty much meet all the qualifications. And everyone there was like, yeah, but we're fighting the war right now. We're all kind of busy for that. Maybe another time. Plus, really, uh, New York and New Hampshire, who both thought Vermont was theirs. Uh, there was enough infighting between the two of them where we need to win this war before we start breaking up over Vermont. We can't have New York or New Hampshire leave the cause because of Vermont. Again, I'm not hating on Vermont. It was very sparsely populated at the time. Still is. Went on my honeymoon there. No hate on Vermont here. Anyway. Uh, he is there when the British uh, take Philadelphia. He flees the city with the Continental Congress. Now, he is in York with the Continental Congress for a while. Once his term concludes, he joins the war effort. He goes down and tries to help one of the ill-fated expeditions into Florida. And once that is complete... Uh, and, or incomplete, uh, he, well, I'm sorry, while he's on that journey, he's named Director General of Hospitals for that mission. Director General of the Hospitals is basically in charge of not just all the wounded soldiers, but supplying the surgeons who need to help the wounded soldiers and finding shelters where within they could help the wounded soldiers. Now, he impresses one Nathaniel Green, during this time. Nathaniel Green, who has taken over the Southern Department, names Nathaniel, Nathan Brownson Purveyor General of Hospitals for the Southern Department. It's a mouthful, I agree. But essentially, everything from Maryland down, um, from uh, everything south of Pennsylvania, every single wounded soldier, every single hospital, every single medical supply was under Nathan Brownson's command. He does this for the remainder of the war and does a pretty good job. Uh, after the hostilities end, Nathaniel Green puts in a temporary, essentially military governor. <laughs> um, because they're waiting for the British to get evacuated and they're suppressing loyalists. And the war is pretty much over, but not completely over. And he puts Nathan Brownson in that position. Brownson's only there for a little bit because... The government has an election shortly thereafter. Now, Brownson, having been away for about five years, he first went to Philadelphia for the Continental Congress, goes to Vermont, goes down to Florida to fight, ends up moving around the colonies as purveyor general of hospitals. By the time the war is over, or the hostilities themselves are over, Brownson hasn't been around for a while. And Georgia had some pretty hotly contested political parties. Thankfully, Brownson was not a member of either of these parties because he wasn't there. So, he is unanimously elected as governor of Georgia because no one could find anything too terrible to say about him. That being said, uh, while he's there, he oversees the transit. He, he begins the transition. Uh, he's only there for a year, but he begins the transition from wartime state to peacetime state. Most notably, what he does is he uh, assists, he negotiates with the Native Americans on the Georgian frontier to secure peace temporarily for many of the people there. Afterwards, I, he essentially retires, kind of. He becomes a justice of the peace and, uh, and goes back to his medical practice to rebuild his medical practice. He ends up moving to Savannah, uh, where he can help build his medical practice, and he attends 
Georgia's ratification convention of the Constitution. Georgia is one of the earliest states to ratify the Constitution and one of the few to overwhelmingly vote for it. Yes, we want your help, everyone north of us. Please help us. Georgia was still very sparsely populated at the time. Uh, he does write to George Washington to ask for a federal position once the Constitution comes around, though this does not happen. Uh, he, but he does go back and he helps rewrite Georgia's state constitution. After the war, many states rewrote their first very quickly written constitutions. Uh, he helps write that one. Uh, and then he's elected to the state senate where he sits for a while as uh, he becomes the first president of the state senate under the new constitution. That is Nathan Brownson. And we're popping into our final founder of the day, Samuel Osgood. The first Postmaster General of the United States. I'm going to take a quick sip of that because I've been talking for almost an hour. Let's speak about Samuel Osgood. Samuel Osgood was in Massachusetts when the revolution starts. And he gets the Lexington alarm. He hears Lexington and Concord are happening and he leads soldiers in his local militia to... Lexington and Concord. He's one of the few major founders that actually participates in Lexington and Concord. He then hangs around, keeping the British pinned down, and he becomes an aide-de-camp to Artemis Ward. And this is before George Washington shows up, where Artemis Ward, for all intents and purposes, was commanding general of the future Continental Army, this ragtag group that it assembled. Once the British evacuate Boston, uh, Boston uh, he does not continue with the army. Instead, he, much like Rufus King we were speaking about earlier, gets elected to the Massachusetts State Assembly. And he serves there throughout the war, including a good length of time on the Massachusetts Board of War. Not only did the Continental Congress have a board of war, the state of Massachusetts, most of the states had their own boards of war. And uh, while the state boards of war were more responsible for what happened within their borders and their own militia, it still was a very important organization to fighting the battles. Osgood served on the board of war throughout most of the uh, most of the revolution. Uh, he attends the state's first constitutional convention, although that doesn't work out very well. Uh, he ends up in the Massachusetts State Senate. Eventually, he is elected to the Continental Congress, and he goes over to the Continental Congress where he uh, also, like many other younger men realizes uh, we might need something better here. But for the second half of the 1780s, Osgood is given one of the few federal positions available. He is chosen as Commissioner of the Treasury for the Confederation. He's supposed to oversee the finances of the Confederation Congress. And they owe a lot of money for this war. And they don't have any money coming in. So he obviously supports the Constitution, though he doesn't go to the convention. He is in favor of the Constitution, and as such, once the, <clears throat> excuse me, once the Constitution is ratified, George Washington goes to be president in New York City, and he needs to name some people to some positions. It just so happens that while he was treasurer of uh, the Continental Congress, Osgood had moved from Massachusetts to New York City. And George Washington shows up in New York City and needs a place to live. And Osgood says, hey, man, why don't you take my house? And Washington does. And the Osgood house becomes the first executive mansion in the history of the United States. Now, today we have the White House. For most of American history, we've had the White House. But we didn't have a White House before the government met to create Washington, D.C. and then the White House. First, George Washington had a rented apartment. And it was the Osgood house. So Samuel Osgood has that under his belt. Uh, my house was the first White House, although it was not white. Um, shortly thereafter, George Washington making appointments for the new federal government. He's a postmaster general, and he chooses Samuel Osgood, who has so much experience at the federal level during the Continental Congress when there really was no federal position. So to have any federal experience would be really important. Uh, he spends about two years there, but once the federal government moves to Philadelphia during its temporary stay there until they move to Washington, D.C., uh, which, side note, in Philadelphia, Robert Morris's house would become the new White House. Uh, Osgood decides not to relocate. He stays in New York City. Uh, he is then elected to New York state government on several occasions, including the state Senate. 
uh, and he serves as the Speaker of the State Senate. So he basically controlled what New York was doing with its legislation. Interestingly enough, <clears throat> Osgood seems to have put politics aside and just worked very hard. Again, much like Rufus King. When Thomas Jefferson becomes president later on, as we mentioned before, he gets rid of most of John Adams' guys. But he actually offers Samuel Osgood a job. He chooses Osgood to be naval officer of the Port of New York. Now, this is naval officer. It's not customs collector. Naval officer, which meant he was in charge of the militia on the port there. Uh, and he was essentially chief of police for New York's port. Not all of New York, just the port, just when it came to federal responsibilities. But meant if someone came in trying not to pay their tariff, the customs collector called old Osgood over here to come over and put a stop to it. Near the end of his life, uh, many banks have been created, especially after Alexander Hamilton got in there and got the whole stock exchange thing going, created a bunch of banks. Uh, they created a company called Citibank of New York. And the first president of Citibank of New York was Samuel Osgood. Now, that company's changed hands a few times, but it's still around today. It's known now as Citigroup, which you may very well have heard of. And we can thank Samuel Osgood for being the first person to oversee that particular piece of American history. Founder fans, thank you so much for watching. I always appreciate it. I have a lot of fun here telling you these stories. Uh, of course, you can like and subscribe. Those are amazing things to do. I uh, put out these videos seven days a week, so this is just a recap. We are playing trivia tomorrow. I should throw out, also, I am going to do another read-along on Saturday evening, probably about 6 o'clock, so look forward to that. Other than that, we're all done here, and I'm going to leave you with George Washington's piece of property we all find so hilarious, Round Bottom.